This is the story of Final Fantasy XIV in Walker, part five of five. Now where we left off, friends and allies from all over the world agreed to aid in the effort of gathering refined adamantite. Also, the hero was taking the Loperets on a tour of Labyrinthos. Let's get started. After cooking Way samples the foods of Aetherus, Thancred remarks at how everyone in Charlian is anxious and busy, while the Loperets express guilt that their work isn't good enough. Under Urian Jay's suggestion, the hero walks around the Charlian hamlet, finding researchers that could use help from the Loperets to make both parties feel better. The hero watches happily as new friendships form. Lively, isn't it? The town is abuzz. Everyone eager to meet with our friends from the moon. An older couple approaches Urian Jay with questions. Oh there! Heard there was a visiting expert who we might bother with a few questions. I take it you'd be the one. Yeah, yes, I am. Wilson and Blavida, Charlian's foremost researchers in the field of teleportation magic, and Moonbreeder's parents. Arfe, the nerve. Sending that letter, then running off to the gods know where. Do you have any idea how worried we were? I... I'm sorry. It was remiss of me not to deliver the news in person. Rian Jay tries to apologize for her death, but they say she was at her happiest when the Scions called her for help. Silly boy. We are all powerless before such grief. They recall childhood memories and express their pride for the man Urian Jay has become. And look at you now, at the center of the crowd. The reason there even is a crowd, having brought these people together. After the crowd disperses, Urian Jay ensures the hero he'll be fine and asks if he could check on Alice. The hero helps with menial tasks like carrying boxes and delivering paperwork to pass the time. After the work is done, Grahatia tells the hero that the infamous Alagan researcher Amon was interested in refined adamantite because he was always fascinated with traversing the Sea of Stars. Amon was also always on a search for meaning. Since he wouldn't have known at the time that he was Hermes, Grahatia wonders if souls have certain dispositions they retain from life to life. The Scions reconvene in the hamlet. Everything is ready to go, except the ether burner still needs the materials. All that remains is to load the final batch of supplies and see everyone on board. Once we've readied the ether burner, that is. Your special delivery has arrived. Round up everyone and come to the harbor at once. Now, where might this delivery be? Oh. By the twelve? Surely, these can't all be. Bleeding hellfire. They're bringing them by sea and by air. Sicard and Amanda Lane argue over who brought more, as Alphanode smiles. Many others arrive from across the world, and Tataru reveals that the twins' mother has been providing finances all along. Mother! Amelians! Barnier remarks that the Scions have met their end of the bargain. For Chanel speaks to his children. I know not what you seek of Hydaelyn, nor for what purpose you would take command of our ship. Yet this much is certain. To do so, will be to dictate the fate of this star and the lives upon it. Do you understand? And are you prepared? We understand what is at stake, and we are prepared to bear this burden. <sighs> then I... I will bear it with you. You grasped my fingers with such tiny hands the day you were born. I thought my heart might burst. He tells them his love for them is overwhelming and he's thankful that his father saved them. But for Chanel, never wanted the forum's plans interfered with as they would be what saves his children. Detest me, fight me tooth and nail. I would suffer it and more and be satisfied so long as I could force you onto the ship. He tells them he's very proud of who they've become. He then apologizes to the other Scions and tells them to keep doing what they do. As the cargo is taken to the engineers, for Chanel takes the heroes to see the Ark. After a moment, they ask to communicate with Hydaelyn. For Chanel takes them to a secret chamber and explains that at the heart of the star, the physical plane and the ethereal plane are one, and they've built a device that utilizes this principle called the Asioscope. He says they'll have to dive deeper than they've ever gone since Hydaelyn's whispers are growing faint and he can't guarantee their safety. 
The heroes enter the Asioscope and battle with restless souls while accompanied by Kryl's voice. At the end, they encounter the sundered soul of Amon, the notorious Allegan scientist. After defeating him, the hero asks about Medion, which puzzles Amon until the hero explains his story. Then it was you, Elpis, with Emmet Suck. <laughs> The final pieces fall into place. <laughs> he says, as Amon, he had a recurring dream that he was Hermes, but he ignored it until he was given Fandaniel's seat and realized it was true. He then talks about the dead recovering their lost memories. I wonder, is Emmet Selk adrift somewhere in this ethereal sea? In defeat, finally remembering your time together in Elpis. He then talks about how life is full of suffering. It matters not. If it flies in the face of all believed right and just, death is the only solution! The soul of Asahi appears, and he's perfectly fine with all the suffering and the final days, but is furious that he was forced to betray his Lord Zenos. But to be made accomplice to the betrayal of Lord Zenos, I would die a thousand deaths to exact my vengeance. Both of them dissipate, and the heroes proceed to find Hydaelyn. And now, the rivers of time converge. The heroes ask questions. You created the moon to deliver mankind from the final days. But is that really how it has to end? We do not wish to abandon this world. We want to protect the source and all of its shards. She says the alternative is to face Medion, but her domain is governed by the forces of Dynamis, not Aether. She then honors each of their strengths and accomplishments. Therein lieth your power, the strength to silence the song of oblivion. Nigh impossible is it to send mortals to the edge of the universe. Should you fail, there will be no second chance. Should you lack the strength to best a supreme deity, I cannot allow you to make the journey. Prove ourselves worthy. Sounds straightforward enough. The heroes face Hydaelyn at the Mother Crystal. Come, prove thy worth. After a spectacular fight, they emerge victorious. I entrust the fate of the universe. Unto you. She gives the hero a crystal which will lead them to Medion, but Alfino questions how they can possibly travel so far. Indeed. To make such a journey would require an astronomical amount of ether. She says they can use the Mother Crystal itself. The Mother Crystal. Our final hope. She then gives the hero a gift, her power channeled into the Crystal of Asm. With that, my work is finished. My love will be with you forever, my dearest children. The heroes return and give the Loperets the navigation crystal. This will lead to the edge of creation where Medion hoards the despair of countless stars. For Chanel expresses his full support for their mission, and they agree to start in the morning. That night, the hero hears a strange, familiar voice in his dreams. To begin, begin. we first, first must, must see the end. the end. The next morning, the Charlian Forum honor their agreement and give the Ark to the Scions. For Chanel and the Loperets say that as Heidelin believes in the hero, so do they. They say it will take some time to get the ship ready. After the meeting, Tataru pulls the hero aside to gift him a new, full set of gear. Then he sits for a meal with friends. My, what a thoughtful surprise. Hmm. Whatever would we do without her? They reflect on how much they've learned and done over the years. What will we learn at the edge of the universe, I wonder? Gods, it feels like only yesterday that we went on that mission to Drybone. Yishtola remarks on how they have united disparate peoples and changed the world, and it may be time to retire as a scion after this final mission. After all... There is no shortage of hands to bear the torch in our stead. 
Thancred and Urian J say they will keep traveling, and Yastola says she wants to see the other reflections. Later, the hero finds Alizé and Grahatia dozing off outside. Knowing them, they're probably dreaming about the celestial adventures to come. Kryle urges the hero not to forget to pursue his own happiness in life. Next, the hero checks on Alfino and finds that Astinian just met his parents for tea. Fell beasts I can face, but I'm not made for idle chit-chat with lords and ladies. Alfino thanks Astinian, but he returns a greater thanks. Were it not for you, I would not be alive today, nor come to terms with Nidhogg's spirit. Meanwhile, Xenos reflects on Alizé's words. You will never get what you want. Not even the battle you pine for so dearly. The following morning, the Scions meet at the Baldessian Annex. The Forum has sent word. The Ark is ready. As a final formality, the Forum bade me ascertain your resolve. So, are you certain you wish to do this? We are. Triumph, as we who remain behind believe you will. Safe journey, all of you, and oh, be safe. As you will have heard, the Ark is ready. All that remains is to board and be on your way. The heroes thank Sid for his efforts to get the ship ready. In case you're wondering about payment, the ongoing existence of the world ought to do. For Chanel announces the name for the vessel. The Starship Ragnarok. Sicard arrives with representatives of all the beast tribes, and Urianje explains that the summoning magic taught by Asians is a derivative of the more pure form, creation magic. Since they cannot transport the massive mother crystal on the ship, the beast tribes will use the mother crystal to create obedient versions of their primals to transport the ship instead. So, borrowing our friend's faith, we'll create deities using the mother crystal's power and send them to the Ragnarok! Sarban explains why the beast tribes are happy to help. Where others vilified and suppressed us, you offered understanding and friendship. In gratitude, we will share with you the true expressions of our gods. Not malevolent deities, but benevolent saviors. Moonbrita's parents give the Scions teleportation devices. Press the button on one, and in a matter of moments, all eight will activate and send their owners back to the Ragnarok. They board the Ragnarok. The gates are open. You may depart when ready. Engage! Our destination, as you know, is Ultima Thule. Lest you wonder, the place is not a star so much as a patch of emptiness. She says they have no idea what Ultima Thule is like and not to hesitate to use their teleporters if they're in danger. Greetings. Oh, have you met one of my sisters? Why have you come? All you had to do was wait. I would have delivered to you your ends. We didn't ask for that. I don't understand. All life is destined to end. Why choose to prolong your suffering? The Scions retort that they acknowledge that life is full of suffering, yet they will fight till their last breath to preserve it. Medion says they have passion. I know it well. For the same passion once burned in many a star before yours. Suffocated and extinguished now. You approach the bounds of my ultimate, where emotions dictate reality.
The Scions awaken and note that Thancred and Medion are both gone. Uh, everyone? It appears we are at our destination. The Loperates note that it's safe for sustaining life and Thancred might just be ahead of them. The Scions get off the ship and set foot on Ultima Thule. Well then, let us search for Thancred while exploring the area. The Scions explore the area and don't see a whole lot. Just a few ruined structures and no sign of Thancred. Dragons? Here? Medion appears and says this is a memory of an old world while it was suffering a slow death. Orion J asks where Thancred is. He is here and there and everywhere within this space. Such a simple thing, unmaking men. Yet somehow, he managed to leave a slither of himself behind. She says his will to survive overpowered the despair here and remade the space they're standing in. That you draw breath is proof that his soul lives on. For how long, however, remains to be seen. She vanishes and the confused heroes press on. Estinian and the hero try to speak with the dragons, but all of them are devoid of hope, have no will, and are simply waiting for oblivion. They learn that their race was conquered by machines of death who descended from the heavens. Estinian tells one dragon that they are capable of journeying to other stars. The dragon says it just leads to more conflict and they tire of existence itself. The Scions are running out of ideas as they've already seen the whole island. Ishtola suggests that maybe Medion is not the one holding them back, but the dragons. Emotions dictate reality in Ultima Thule, and the dragons have chosen no way forward. Urian Jay mentions one dragon whose suffering is heavier than the others, so they head to him. Waiting to die like all the others, are you? The dragon says they desire only to be as stone, still and lifeless, until the end of time. So you say. Yet your kind has found a new beginning on our star. Estinian tells the dragon of Midgard Sormir and that generations of his children fill the skies on another star. The dragon smells the blood of dragons on Estinian and says no matter where they go, there will be war, so they choose to go nowhere. Yet lasting peace does not come to those who simply retreat from conflict. There is no nobility in your penance. You wallow in self-pity. Estinian draws his weapon and taunts the dragon, and a black cloud forms from a small black bird. I see. This is the emotion that bars our way. No! Not Estinian too! He's opened the way for us. Sacrificed himself to remake this place. Like Thancred did. The heroes take Estinian's path to a new island. Exploring this island, they find bizarre carvings and intelligent creatures like they've never seen. They call themselves the Ia, and they say they dispensed with their flesh bodies long ago, but have since wanted flesh forms again. They want their forms back so they can end their own existence. Orianje asks why they want to end themselves. They give a primer of their own history. Their ancestors dedicated themselves to the pursuit of knowledge and solving problems. In time, they found the flesh was the center of it, and they discovered a way to live eternally as non-corporeal entities with no troubles. They then spent generations pursuing knowledge until they deciphered the laws of creation and a fundamental truth, which they tell the Scions to decide if they want to hear it. Then they leave. Ishtola wants to know what led such an enlightened people to desire to end themselves, so they agree to hear it. Urianje pulls Grahatia and the hero aside. They figure out that Medion must have made contact with the dragons and the Ia before they actually ended, but amplified their despair and caused their ends. Please continue. Tell us about this truth you discovered. They talk about the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe. The stars will continue to spread apart, as will their finite thermal energies. Eventually, all heavenly bodies will grow cold and freeze. No new stars will be born, and the universe will enter onto an eternal ice age. The universe as we know it would end, and there is no way to prevent it. They say their civilization collapsed under the weight of this knowledge, and many chose to destroy their own souls. Etched upon these stones are the testaments of such souls, though many left no words at all, thinking it a pointless gesture. They say abandoning the pursuit of knowledge is the only way. While I appreciate your advice, I will not heed it. In my mortal years, I doubt I could even approach the wisdom of the air. But of one thing am I absolutely certain. 
I would not be happier in ignorance. I will always seek out new knowledge. And no conclusion of yours, no matter how grim, can dampen my desire. Before Yastola dissipates, she says there may be a way to bring everyone back using Azum's magic, but they can't because they'd lose the way forward. We came here knowing what victory may cost, so press on. Press on, and do not look back. Rianjay joins her to help weave a greater path. What's this? An extinguished civilization? Rekindled? That's right! Our quest doesn't end here! We'll press on! And we will find you! There. That's where you'll find me. Medion explains that death is part of the cycle of life and that souls are reborn, so she's created a dead son to hold souls and stop the cycle. True salvation lies not in dying. It lies in not being born. After a moment of silence, the heroes continue to the next island and find it filled with mechanical wreckage and functioning machines which call themselves the Omicrons. The heroes learn that conquest is their prime objective and they have destroyed countless worlds, most recently that of the dragons. Their master, Stigma I, has not issued commands in a long time so they stand ready for combat but idle. The heroes find once again there is no way off the island and sensing the pattern, decide they need to figure out what emotion is blocking their path. Grahatia suggests they seek out Stigma I, called Sir for short. They find a terminal, but it's unresponsive. Well, I'm out of ideas. Rahatia suggests they strike the terminal with lightning. Because it relies upon it, or something akin to it, as a source of energy. It worked! The Scions ask a few questions about why there are no orders for the Omicrons, and Sir says all is in accordance with the guidelines, but they press on and ask if something has gone wrong and still get nowhere. Reply. Negative. All citizens continue to operate at maximum effect. The connection closes. As this Sir told us, there just haven't been any new instructions and everyone is standing by. Moments later, the hero spots one Omicron that is running around erratically, and follows it to a strange tree with a device attached to it. The machine, named M017, says the tree is on life support. He says there is no need to keep it alive, but he's puzzled why it continues to sprout leaves and seeds with no purpose. M017 then apologizes for working outside his assigned duty and dashes off. Alfino says M017 has more consciousness than the others and may be linked to Sir. So Alice a says she will strike the console with lightning again while the others watch M017 for a response. She does and they see anomalies on M017. As you have surmised, I am part of the shared intelligence of Stigma 1. He explains that he is Stigma 1 and long ago he abandoned his duty to inhabit the body of M017. May we ask why you did this? From what we gather, it seems to be a personal matter. Stigma 1 gives a brief history of the Omicrons. Long ago, they had feeble bodies, but learned to augment themselves with machine parts to compete with their enemies. Over time, they replaced every body part with machines and eventually converted the brain itself to data. This empowered them to conquer their star, but they still feared alien civilizations, so they continued their conquests across the stars to reign supreme. They grew ever more powerful as they conquered more stars, and now they have no equal. Their entire existence has been in service to this objective, and they no longer have an objective. You could find no threat to justify your purpose. I believe I know how to overcome this despair. He turns to M017 and speaks about identity and the soul, and gives his own experiences in bonding with the tower, traveling through time, and never knowing what makes him who he is. So I posit this. Who we were need not prescribe what we now hold in our hearts. So I urge you to not give up. Heed your heart's desire and hope that the future you long for shall be realized. Melancholy but determined, they walk Grahatia's path and find silent empty structures on the next island. Medion approaches and says there is no life here, nor an explanation of what happened. The heroes explore the island anyway. 
There are no denizens to bar our path, yet there is no way forward. After some thought, Alfino says the soul that needs convincing here is Medion herself, and that he and his sister need to do it. Ah, there you are. It was as I said, was it not? Alfino tells her that since she is here, the place is not totally lifeless. Then he talks about how afraid she must have been when she first discovered stars like this, and at the thought of reporting this information back to Hermes. He says she can learn to overcome her fear. Why would I bother with such an insignificant emotion? If the despair I command is as a raging river, then fear is but a trickling stream. Alizé says her fear is greater now than before her journey to the stars. That Meteon feared simply to move forward, but your fear is such that you've given up on everything. Alfino talks about feelings of pain and despair and overcoming them. But these experiences are part of life, and they make us stronger. We, we rise, fall, and rise, rise again. again. The hero is now alone at the edge of the universe, but a new way forward has appeared. Meanwhile, in Old Charlian, everyone is anxious to know what's going on. Oh, they'll be fine. I know they will. Footsteps are heard as a man approaches. As the hero walks the final path, he hears encouragements from friends of the past. Do not despair. You are not without allies. A future shaped by the choices we made in ways we could never foresee. He approaches Medion. Struggle will avail you not, nor will it grant your comrades peace. He grasps Asm's crystal firmly in hand and hears many voices. Perhaps when our time comes to return to the star, we shall remember these few days we have lost. Do not squander it, the legacy I leave you. I bid them remember, but all this time I'm the one who had forgotten. A right fool you've made of me, Hermes. Oh, come now. It's been a gripping tale. Unbreakable bonds and noble sacrifice, sprinkled with moments of levity to counterbalance the pathos. It's got it all. Emmett Selk turns to Medion. You will not end our journey. That is our answer. The answer of all lives of Atheris, past and present. Ours is the power to create. A flower. Yes. Upon your return, I will gift you a beautiful flower. These Elpis blooms serve as proof that this realm is not utterly devoid of hope. Emmett Selk says it's time to use Asm's crystal to restore the heroes. End it! Silence it! Silence our song of oblivion! Emmett Selk and Hithlidaeus begin to return to the Ethereal Sea. Spare me your pity. If you would do something for me, save our star. Come then, follow me down into the darkest depths of despair. The heroes make their way through the dead ends, fighting through the ends of various worlds, and at the end defeat Rala, the Last Mercy. What must I do? What pain must I visit upon you to make you surrender to despair? Alice responds that they lift each other up and carry on, but Medion says where there is hope, there is always despair. So shall we die in pain. We die in suffering. How are you to live? Who are you to hope? The 
The Scions try to take down the Insinger, but she sweeps them away in a mighty wind. The hero uses the teleportation device and lets it go, sending the others back to the ship while he alone faces the Insinger. Defiant to the last, but you will be one with us ere long. Just then, there's a crack in the sky and a dragon flies in. At the end of everything, I find you, my friend. It's Xenos. He says he struck a deal with Kryl, then gorged on the remains of the Mother Crystal to become a dragon and fly here. He agrees to help the hero defeat the Insinger so that they may finally have their rematch. Riding on the back of the dragon Xenos, the hero confronts and defeats the Insinger at the edge of creation. Where lies happiness? In the aftermath, the hero takes Medion's hand and lets her feel his life's experiences. She is moved by all the touched lives. That which Hermes sent us to find was there all this time, on Atheris. She says she will sing a song of hope. One day, life will fill the universe again, and Hermes will see this and smile. She makes a path for the hero to return home, but Xenos approaches the hero for his rematch. They fight for what feels like ages, and both collapse from exhaustion. Xenos speaks about the trivialities of life, but says fights like these give him meaning. As the hero fades, an activated teleporter drops next to him. Are you... Are you with us? He awakens on the ship as they approach Aetherus. We're home, my friend. We're home. It's the Ragnarok! They're back! Later at the Rising Stones, Alfino writes a letter to his parents in which he says they're disbanding the Scions of the Seventh Dawn. Joining the others, he says they will work independently for now. But a day will come when we face another great challenge, and we will face it together, as we always have. Each of them say what they plan to do next. I see. Then it is here the Scions at last part ways. Each to some far-flung corner of the realm. But the hero himself has not divulged his plans. So, what's next for our humble adventurer? In Elpis, an unknown ancient speaks of a place called Pandemonium. Oh, the sights we shall see. The sights we shall see. And that concludes not only the story of Inwalker, but the entire Hydaelyn Zodiac arc. Thanks for sticking around through all these videos. See you next time. <laughs>